our first album of the night, Damaged by Black Flag, our first Black Flag album that we've ever covered. And um, we talked about hardcore before, and, and we'll talk about what that is and why it's there. Um, but uh, have you guys, before I, I introduce the music, how familiar were you guys with the music of Black Flag? I was kind of knew them by reputation. I've definitely heard Rise Above and TV Party Tonight at, at different times. And the hardcore scene itself has kind of always overlapped with some of the artists I saw in high school and college. And I probably saw some hardcore bands at some point, but it was never something I really sought out. Um, that's kind of my... And I know Henry Rollins, obviously, because he's had a, a long career after Black Flag of... I don't know pontificating on different things and mm -hmm. and being a spoken word type of person or you know performer in that sense um, and he played a thug in heat too didn't he <laughs> yes he did yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's in sons That's of right. anarchy and, and other things like that how about you yeah, how familiar, familiar yeah not much at all okay. i mean i know of them i knew they're hardcore i i knew uh tv party uh that was the only song i knew on this so uh not much not much Gotcha. Well, uh, in the montage, uh, you would have heard uh, Police Story was in there, and now you're going to hear a little bit from Six Pack. <laughs> Okay, Black Flag Damaged, one of the more interesting uh, bios that we're going to have. I will try to keep it somewhat um, concise because there's a lot to go over here. So Let me run Black the numbers before you get in there, yep. John. Yep. Uh, so Black Flag's Damage comes in at number 126 in the 1980s on Best Ever Albums, number 9 in 1981, number 846 of all time. It is Black Flag's highest rated album on Best Ever Albums, and it also represents the only album that we're covering tonight that was in Rolling Stone's list, coming in at number 487. Okay. So Black Flag was founded in Hermosa Beach, California. They were initially called Panic. Here is actually something that uh, I wasn't sure of, and I wonder if you guys would do it, because I, I know this is one of those things when people are listening. Um, as much as I know about Black Flag's legacy, the individual pieces besides Henry Rollins were a little bit more disparate to me. Um, I actually mm -hmm. kind of knew Raymond Pettibone, the guy who designed their art, better than I think I might have known the rest of the band members. And so I kind of dug around looking for pronunciations. The, the band founder, he's their guitarist and songwriter as well, is Greg Ginn, I believe. But I just want to make sure it's not Greg Ginn. I'm pretty certain it's Greg Ginn. But mm -hmm. while I'm running the, the bio, if you guys want to hold me accountable, because I don't want to be that guy, you know, as I'm doing the, um, the research. But uh, uh, Greg and some local friends uh, founded the band and what was happening was they were doing, uh, he wanted to do band practice for several hours each day. And as you might imagine from guys that are kind of doing this on the side, uh, not something that a lot of folks sort of wanted to do. Um, and so there's a lot of turnover in the early lineup. Uh, this is interesting because with Black Flag, uh, they're part of that, that hardcore punk scene, the DIY ethos. And so the work ethic is, is sort of a piece of the, the DNA of that mindset. So it was present even early there in 1976. Uh, eventually, um, uh, Greg uh, Ginn and Keith Morris, uh, who is the vocalist, would just record. And they would actually oftentimes record without a bassist because they had trouble keeping one. And this is kind of what is credited with helping to create um, his guitar sound, especially in the early days, because when uh, Black Flag started, they were a single guitar band. Uh, by the time this album is released, they actually, uh, it was their first, this album, Damaged, uh, was their first with two guitarists, and we'll talk about how that happened. Um, they eventually get uh, Chuck Dukowski as the bassist and Brian Migdal as the drummer, and they hold their first formal performance on December 1977 in... Redondo Beach, which I can't ever hear without thinking of Patti Smith. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's like a place that when I want to say the name, I want to say, you know, in Redondo Beach, you know, just because it's, yeah, it's so synonymous with that for me. Anyway, uh, there was another band named Panic. Uh, so they actually then changed their name to Black Flag and they played their first show under this name on January 27th, 1979. 
Um, the band name was suggested, as I mentioned before, Raymond Pettibone is actually the brother of Greg Ginn. Um, so he's Raymond Ginn, but he goes by uh, that nom de plume. He designed the, 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 the logo, which is a very famous logo, and he described the name as meaning, if white flag means surrender, then black flag represents anarchy, <laughs> uh, which is an awesome quote. Um, the band begins to spray paint the logo all over L.A., which got them notoriety from people that saw it and were interested and began attending their shows. But also it was the first time, but certainly not the last time, that the LAPD became aware of Black Flag. Because <laughs> yeah. one thing about Black Flag was their scenes, uh, their scene and the L.A. punk scene in general, which we touched on before with X, but mm-hmm. specifically mentioned that X sort of rejected <laughs> elements of that scene. And it, it, one of the things they rejected was the violence of the scene. And that violence would sort of haunt Black Flag all the way through uh, the 80s in terms of their shows. They just attracted a very, very um, vigorous crowd response and unfortunately sometimes a very um, violent crowd response, including band members uh, getting into fights with the audience regularly. Um, and the LAPD, we'll talk about that a little bit, but the LAPD actually had at, at certain times investigations and, and stuff into the band because they viewed them as sort of negative influences. So Southern California at this time, how it was in the reading that I've done, uh, there was a limited punk scene, which is kind of funny in some ways, knowing what came out of it later. But it seemed like punk was sort of located primarily in, at this time, two places, uh, the Bay Area, and uh, as you know, we saw with the Dead Kennedys, right? And then right. New York. And there were, in the Midwest, there were small little pockets of punk, and certainly in the early 80s, um, there would be vibrant scenes all over the place. But, you know, around 78, 79, it was really SoCal and, um, and New York City. Uh, L.A. did have a little bit of a punk scene, but uh, the major club in L.A. was really... Uh, parochial towards bands that were from LA proper and so Black Flag coming from Hermosa Beach was sort of iced out a little bit from playing uh, there. Uh, The band, so instead of that, because they really didn't have a lot of formal venues to play, they basically did what you think of with punk rock and, and underground rock. They just papered the area with flyers, booked their own gigs, played anywhere that they could talk their way into. Dukowski in particular is often credited and and brought up in stories as a big part of their rise because he was the spokesman for the band and often was good at talking them into gigs. But they did the whole playing at barbecues, playing at, you know, high school gym, like basically anywhere that would take them, kind of. Uh, The band proceeds with the lineup I mentioned until 1979 when the drummer Migdal is replaced by Brazilian percussionist Robo. Um, which is an awesome name for a a drummer. And uh, Morris, the vocalist, leaves in 1979 uh, and is replaced by Chavo Penderast. Morris actually leaves and forms another pretty famous band, the Circle Jerks, uh, who you may have heard of. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's an all-timer band name right there, I think, as well. Uh, Chavo uh, Penderast is... uh, And at this time, there's kind of like... And and Henry Rollins actually falls into this as well. Black Flag had this... um, this trick where they would just bring fans up to sing as the lead singer at different times. And that was kind of, you know, how it was described. Uh, there's another uh, gentleman, uh, last name Reyes, who was also a singer for Black Flag for a while. Um, it's very interesting because in the resources I go to, there are differences in names, like all music and um nme and different stuff. they're using different names for the various singers and i don't know if these are different people or if there's overlap so i'd love to hear from a black flag fan to kind of clean that stack a little bit because uh, i got a little bit um i was a little bit unsure of which names to use at different times because at different times in the exact lineage of the band different names were being used so i wasn't sure if it was the same person or if it was different people so uh, I guess the most important thing to know, though, is that uh, uh, their lead singer quits mid-set in 1980 uh, because of the fan violence and just they were over it. Uh, that was a big thing right there. Um, another fan named Des Cardena uh, joins the band. Uh, he is the singer, but pretty much um, 
blows out his vocal cords after about a year of singing because he's not a trained singer and his preference was to play the guitar anyway so two big things happen um uh, pretty much in 1981 the first is that cardena is like you know what i'm gonna i want to become a guitarist instead so they actually start writing second guitar parts on all the black flag songs and so cardena is doing this uh, as they're finishing up a tour uh, at around the same time and, and to help facilitate that Henry Rollins, who's basically a fan of Black Flag, who's corresponding with the band. He's from D.C. Um, he was in a band known as SOA, or State of Alert, in the D.C. area. Um, and what happens is he goes to a Black Flag show when they're on their East Coast tour. Um, he gets invited to sing the song Clocked In on the stage. They're impressed by his energy, and they invite him to join. Mm-hmm. He's initially skeptical, but actually uh, the, gets pushed over the edge in a good way by uh, his childhood friend, Ian McKay of Fugazi, who we're going to cover as well. Um, I did not know that Henry Rollins and Ian McKay, I knew they were both from D.C., um, so it makes sense, but I did not know that they were like lifelong childhood friends. Um, So Rollins finished, once that tour is going on, the East Coast tour, he actually serves as the roadie for the rest of the tour, where he learns Black Flag's catalog, and then Cardena is um, uh, writing the second guitar parts. Um, and the band was impressed by his intensity, but also the fact that Rollins was uh, a known sort of music omnivore. And in particular, he was known as introducing um, and being in the D.C. area. This I thought interesting. He uh, introduced the band to the go-go music of D.C., which was a brand of funk that is very big in the D.C. area um, and has been celebrated recently, especially in the D.C. area. So the band goes into the studio to record Damaged, which is their first album proper. Uh, their producer is a gentleman known as Spot, <laughs> who worked for SST Records, their record company, um, and he hated the two guitar lineup. Um, he preferred them as a one guitar band, and he also hated the production of this, even though he did it because he said the band told him to record it the way it sounds, but he thought it was very muddy, and he thought the earlier albums were cleaner, and that was his preference, but he kind of, he wanted to be true to what the band wanted, and he felt the band wanted a muddier sound, and this was, this album was what he considered to be their muddiest sound. Um, One thing that's hard to talk about, I, I mean, when you talk about Black Flag, there's the constant lineup changes is one thing you have to talk about. Number two is their shows, and the energy and the violence at them because that was something that was a piece of them consistently. Um, and then the third is Black Flag, even even by record company <laughs> st- like label stories and contracts that we have, we've had a lot of them, right? I think CCR kind of is the one we always say takes the cake. But mm-hmm. Black Flag's cut one of the most notorious record label stories ever. I am going to share this. Um, and then, you know, I'll have a couple postscripts at the end, but I'll give you a little bit of a rundown. Um, what happened was Black Flag kind of, as much as they could be commercial, right? They, they felt like it was, the time was going to be then, right, to, to jump on it a little bit. And uh, they were going to be distributed by a, a record company or record label, I should say, uh, Unicorn Records, which is a subsidiary of MCA. So what happened is as the album was about to come out, MCA... Uh, wouldn't release it. The uh, executive determined the album was anti-parent, was how it was described. (laughs) Um, There is a lot of description of what this was. Some people say they really thought they meant it. Other people thought that uh, that was sort of a cover for the fact that they thought they were going to lose money on it because Unicorn Records was basically deeply in debt. Even at that uh, point, they would actually go fully broke. Uh, in 1983 but 1980 to 1983 is a long time and so what happened was unicorn records sued black flag they had a legal dispute and they actually were not allowed to use the name black flag from 1981 until 1983 at all so there were times in which they released they released a compilation album um between this one and, and future uh full lengths um, where they would just put the names of the band members on it. There was one that all it had was the anti-parent statement from um, MCA. Um, the dispute was basically that um, 
the damn this album was released on SST Records because Black Flag thought, well, they're not, you know, Unicorn's not going to put it out, and we want it out, so we'll put it out on SST Records, which was kind of like more of a underground punk uh, label. And Unicorn sued them, and it was hung up in courts for three years. Jeez. It wasn't until 1983 in which. Um, they finally were able to get out of it um, because uh, it, uh, Unicorn went bankrupt, um, but they were under an injunction for years where they couldn't release uh, stuff. The most notable one was they released a compilation album called Everything Went Black, and it was credited to the individual musicians and not Black Flag. Now, if you were to buy those albums now, they would have Black Flag on them, but there was a period of time when they didn't, which kind of added to the, um, the ethos of the band a little the bit. The mystique. The mystique, exactly. It kind of plays in a little yeah. bit to everything in here as well. Okay, that's about as long a bio as I ever do right there. There's more interesting stuff about Black Flag, and I'll try to weave some stuff into uh, the commentary. But let's start with uh, Matt. Thoughts on this one? So this is my maybe my version of John trying to listen to electronic music. Um, <laughs> hardcore is going to be a hard sell for me. Um, yeah, was this so, played out loud in your house when you were listening? This to was it? not played out loud in my house. No, it wasn't. Um, I think I tried at one point, and Sherry's just like, I'm like, I don't think you're going to like this. She goes, no. And I was like, got it. So, um, yeah, I, I will say this. I don't, I'm surprised. I don't hate it. Right. Like, I, I you know, this is something it, it's just it's but it, at the same time, it's just not really it, it's not really my style. It's not really my genre. This music is not for me. Um, it's missing many elements that are kind of pretty important for me to enjoy as a music fan. One melodies and hooks. You're not getting any of that right, in here. Right. You're not getting any really interesting beats or, um, you know, different time signatures or kind of interesting, you know, artistic changes it's is just this is raw energy right this is just right. this is loud raw energy it's powerful um and uh it's it certainly makes sense that the shows would be violent um i don't like going to quote i, well, I don't really go to violent shows but like i don't i also when i go to just shows and there's like a, a mosh pit or whatever like yeah. I, I never like that like part of the reason is because is i'm not that big of a dude so like i'm gonna if i'm caught up in something i'm gonna be in trouble um because i can't really hold my own in that type of environment so uh and i just i don't, I don't know it's just it's never really uh, grabbed me um or been something that i connected with john you keep talking about i need to feel it in my in my mm -hmm. gut or i need to feel it loins so I, I, loins wherever right i don't i don't really feel this anywhere um, but there's some things in here that I did find enjoyable. Like I do, like I'm going to go to the lyrics here, believe it or not, like TV party made me laugh, right? Like it's, <laughs> yeah. that, that's a funny song. You know, when they start talking about all the shows they watch and they're throwing down early eighties shows like Dallas oh. and Hill street blues. And you know, can, can just, we, yeah. I funny. don't know if they is the correct word right there. Shows that some watch would be, I think of more, <laughs> Uh, direct, right. <laughs> direct yes. interpretation of that yeah, lyric. Yeah, yes, that's um, right. Exactly. But it's just, it's just the fun. It's just the the, the references were funny. Um, yeah. And uh, you know the TV breaks, and it's like, what are we gonna do? You know. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, man, I tried. I listened to this several times. I think the more I listened to it, the more I didn't hate it. I would say. Uh, you know, I, I found I'm like you know, and I think it's one of those things where I probably. You know, if I was exposed to it more, if this was more of something that I was into when I was, a, you know, younger, if this would be an easier sell. I was actually talking to my buddy, Superfan Kevin, who's a big fan of hardcore, and I was talking to him and his buddy Jeff, who's there. They're both very much into this, and so they were trying to, like, explain to me, like, why it's so why it's so great, which is always a hard thing to do. It's hard to sell somebody. Yeah. You know, you can you can give me all the logical things, you know, reasons why you like a band, but if it's still not connecting with me, it's it's hard to do so. But I do. Uh, uh, Jeff was saying that um, you know this was a cool album for him because for many years it was not available. Like it's one of those albums that for whatever reason wasn't um, wasn't wasn't something that was in a, no, typical record stores or whatever. And when he finally got it, it made sense because he was able to see all the elements of punk and uh, and, and 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 hardcore music that he loves like kind of starting here or this being like kind of a seminal album for what stuff, you know, came later that he really liked. So that totally makes sense. But at the end of the day, this is 
I can't talk about re-listenability. Not really there for me. I wouldn't want to go to the shows. Um, it's just, it's it's too much. This has turned up to 11 for me, and uh, it's it's a little bit uh, too much for me. So I'm going to go a thumbs down on Black Flag, just because it, but it's my personal thing. But I know people love this band. I know the influence that they have. And uh, like, you know, like I say, a lot of times with stuff like this, I'm glad it's out there because it's, you know, I, I think variety of music is awesome and mm-hmm. can spawn so many different things and influence so many artists. But this is definitely not for me. Um, one last thing, though, uh, Padded Cells a song on here. Yeah. John, um, I you remember my buddy Mo in uh, Florida, but mm-hmm. Mo's band yeah. was named Padded Cell. So I'm like, I think oh, I picked and that Mo's, up immediately. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I think Mo's I think Mo was and Mo was his band or whatever was kind of like this, you know, hardcore stuff anyway. So uh, I'm pretty sure that that's where he picked that up from. So that's the other thing I learned here. But yeah, this is a tough sell for me. I just, it's not my thing. Yeah. I knew it would be, uh, I'd be surprised if you had felt another way about it. Yeah. Matt, <laughs> Remember we <laughs> talked about knowing how Matt, some thinks he's going to love or hate. Yeah. I think well, Josh, it, the softballs safe, but... don't get much more, you know, bigger than this one here though. So, but yes, this, yeah. Josh thoughts. Josh, are you on mute? Yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I have mixed feelings about um, this. I feel like, like you said, it's raw, it's it's angry, it's energy, and I feel like if it, it takes a certain person to kind of really respond to it, and I think when you hear hardcore, you, you either respond to it right away or you don't, and I think it's probably also depends on what age you are when you hear it. I think it's a formative... Uh, type of music for people who feel um, rejected or or feel angry or who can't kind of elucidate why they feel the way they feel and I think this kind of gives truth to power on a lot of those feelings and feeling disenfranchised and kind of upset at the world but maybe not knowing how how to say it um, John is Henry Rollins like co co-writer of the lyrics or is he like I know you said the other guy Greg Ginn was kind of the leader. I, I think it's, I, yeah, I think it's a joint, a okay. joint. Uh, it actually says on Wikipedia yeah. that Greg Ginn writes writes everything, okay. and the yeah, only he, thing, the only writing credit that Rollins is attributed to is Damaged One. So yeah, he's and, not Rollins, writing on this. Ro, yeah, Rollins really started writing a lot more after this, but mm-hmm. a lot of his writing was also um, stuff outside of just Black Flag. You know, it was kind of it was yeah. more um, how it was often described was sort of his intensity and his. Um, moralism, right? Yeah. Kind of, and and they didn't do as many what they called funny songs anymore. It became yeah. pretty much all intense, all the time. Kind of was yeah. mood wise, but yeah, it was. It, Gin is kind of, and it is Gin, by the way. I did my homework, yeah. and I just wanted to make sure. Um, uh, it's sort of credit as being the lyricist. Yeah. So, yeah, Matt, I agree with you that um, you know it's it's not the most musical type of music. It's pretty basic it's uh in terms of you know it's basic beats and and i think rollins is the front man and front and center to the music i mean it's it's basically a background for delivering the lyrics in in some way i think rollins is really effective at bringing his anger and energy to delivering the lyrics and and is convincing i feel like the the his emotionality comes through when delivering the lyrics. You believe that he's like, he believes these things when he's saying, which I think is more than a lot of artists um, that try and do stuff. I mean, they, they are akin, you know, I think that dead Kennedys had more of kind of a, you know, they were more satirical than Mm -hmm. this is, but this is, um, but you believe that Rollins is, is going through all of these things or had at some point it's it's a um well all of them really right. i mean he's he's the yeah he's the cipher for it but yeah yeah i mean but like you said that damage song he i think he name checks his own kind of experience mm-hmm. with his father in that and um i i view this as kind of like music as therapy as a way to like work through your feelings um it's it's honest and upfront which i appreciate um but and it's a way that it's it's almost like like tribal music in some sort of way like mm. if you're in the mosh pit you are like in there to just like get the energy out and like kind of do something with all of the frustration and feeling and i think that's like the conduit through with 
which this music is delivered. Um, so I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, there's definitely social commentary in here. The, the You can't listen to this and not like read the lyrics and at least know what they're talking about. If you're just listening for the music, you're not going to really get much out of it, I think. Um, but, you know, Rise Above and, and Police Story and uh, our social commentary, Six Pack is kind of like a commentary on people who just drink all the time. And, um, you know, depression is about <laughs> depression and um, life of pain. You know, the titles are very like they describe exactly what the song is about. Life of Pain is about self-destruction. Um, I thought it was funny that Padded Cell name checked Walden too in the in the <laughs> lyrics. That was funny. Skinner's book. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So I like it. It's it's despite the songs being fast and quick, it kind of is a lot to take in listening to it as an album. I think it's more of like a live experience type of thing that makes it enjoyable or kind of one off songs and, um, but. So I mixed because I don't like love it. I like the Dead Kennedys a lot more, but I also appreciate kind of what they're trying to go for, and I think there is like a place for this type of type of music. Yeah, it's it's very difficult for me to analyze this as as like a musical piece, right? Because yeah. I don't even think this was primarily designed for artistic merit like these i I think and i think maybe matt that might be step one because i i think in many ways this is this is about lifestyle and culture it's almost like what andy warhol imagined the velvet underground as right like a they're a band right but really they're more an idea Mm -hmm. and like the um the house band for a scene a little the mc5 right that's another band like that um, but I think they actually share quite a bit in common yeah. with, but they, they were as much about the scene. And I almost feel like that's what Black Flag is here. They, they're not here to, I, they have all kinds of musical influences, which is interesting because they're everything from jazz to, um, you know, kiss to funk to everything in between. But I think that's as much about sort of their influences and the the world, like the worldliness a little bit as it is about how it sounds sonically. This is really just the sound of being angry and that's how it's channeled. And if I think one of the things is to understand hardcore, you have to be in a, just like there's certain music that, it sounds like Nick Drake, I always felt like would sound better if you were depressed, right? Because he was writing from that standpoint when we covered him. It is, if you are not an angry person or you don't get to a visceral anger from time to time, I would imagine this music is somewhat baffling to you because you have to know that feeling to, I think, begin to connect with this music, if that makes sense. Yeah, And I think... Yeah, it's it's kind of like you know uh, Henry Rollins, like your id to some degree up there on your stage, and uh, I know people are talking about the mosh pet, but there's plenty of people at these shows that are just silently, intensely right experiencing the music too. It's not just people bumping into each other or punching people. People experience this music all kinds of different ways, and that's what this is. It's looking at the world and saying. You know, the Dead Kennedys like looked at the world and said, this is a fucked up place, but there's some humor in this and let's kind of, you know, wink and nod while we do it. But the, uh, that's not how Black Flag's doing it. Black Flag's like, I'm legitimately angry at the fact that there's, you know, selfish people, people who don't think, people, you know, who, you know what I'm saying? It's just, yeah. it's kind of, it's a view and it's it's got elements of that straight edge movement, even though none of these guys are straight edge. Rollins, even himself, did a little bit of drinking and drugs when he was younger, not a ton and, and went away from it. But the rest of the band was pretty outspoken about, you know, smoking plenty of like weed and stuff like that. But so they're not straight edge, but they have a lot of the feel of straight edge. Um, you know, Minor Threat would sort of take that and create that scene. But it's that idea. It's like looking at people and saying people don't think about things. People aren't serious about things. People are casual. People are too emotional. Um, and all that different stuff is here. And you hear it throughout all of their songs, whether it be, you know, Six Pack is basically about people that don't have a lot and don't aspire to much more. It's actually about their earlier singer, Morris, 
Um, but it's kind of universal in that sense. TV parties, like we're just going to sit and watch TV and not think. Police story, I'm sure, was informed by <laughs> their interactions with the LAPD, which was, you know, decades ahead of the early 90s. Um, and yeah, uh, there's mental health in here, right? In damaged and padded cell, life yep. of pain. I mean, most of side two reads sort of like um, therapy, right? And that's why it's yep. so interesting because, you know, Henry Rollins is singing these things that often are autobiographical for him, but he's not writing the lyrics. So it's a yep. lot of folks to some degree. And I, I think the name of this album being called Damaged, like Josh said, is correct because there's an element of catharsis that comes from this. So uh, that's a very long description because, yeah, I could talk about, like, the, the chainsaw guitar is all over this. There is rhythm guitar on this now, which I, I am familiar enough with what Black Flag sounded like before and after this to know that there really wasn't that ahead of time. Um, but, re, you know, the bass is there, but none of these things are designed to be virtuoso. They are designed yeah. to sort of blend together to create yeah. an experience with you know uh, the vocalist always serving as a hammer to some degree and the the drumming is always uh, there's a lot of down kicks and uh, down beats on the drumming to kind of like you know that sort of sound along the way that i always sort of describe as like a like a fuse almost like a fuse burning down um which gives a certain frantic feel um there's not a track over 350 i think on this entire album in length and there's many that are add a minute and a half and, and under a minute and a half. Um, I would say this is the rare album that I am not going to rate thumbs up, thumbs down, or thumbs in the middle because I don't think that's how it's designed to be. I think it's very much of its time and very much an experience. Um, I understand a lot of the the feelings of hardcore. I am not a concentric circle with the movement, but I feel like um, my worldview is a cousin to it. Um, my worldview, much like Josh mentioned, is a little bit more Dead Kennedys, I think, than it is this, but it doesn't take much to sort of take those circles and overlap them here um, because it's just a matter of style as opposed to a matter of vision. Does that make sense? It's kind of almost like what happens when sort of things maybe went a little bit better for you, you know what I mean? And you didn't have to unpack trauma as well as having that worldview. That's kind of how I look at at what hardcore is, right? Like when you add in another layer of trauma and, um, yeah. you know, testosterone, because this is not a female scene at all. This is a <laughs> definitively yeah. male scene. And I don't just say that as a stereotype. It literally is defined as a male scene. Um, and as a result, this is the expression of a certain type of manhood. Some would say it's everything wrong with manhood, right? Some would say it's peak manhood. And some would say there's a complexity to it, right? That's the essence of elements of manhood, right? I, I would say that I'm in that third group, if that makes sense. So what would you... Well, did you rate this on your scale, though? <laughs> I, I mean, I will because for completest sake, but it's it's almost a fool's errand to do it because yeah. I almost consider this to be like performance art to some degree. So as opposed to music. Yeah, to, to, some, to some degree. Yeah, yeah, I think that music just happens to be the vet. But that's why I think Henry Rollins went into spoken word later and, mm. you know, a lot of these guys, there's a there's a graphic art element to it because the. The graphic art around Black Flag is shocking. I mean, you can, if you look it up, it's shocking at its time, right? There's, you know, guns being placed in cops' mouths, you know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, there's just, it's a lot, it's it's designed to be somewhat shocking. And it's an outgrowth of, like, anger at, mm -hmm. at the society and situation. So, yeah, and that's, that, that's, and that's, and that's the thing. I've never been an angry person. Like, yeah. it's not like, you well, know. Well, this and isn't I can... for you. It can't exactly. be. Exactly. It's, it's not for you. Yeah. Right. And that's, and that's why, yeah, that's why it doesn't 
speak to me, you know, because and even though I can right. totally say like, yeah, I get fed up with, with stupid people or selfish people or just the state of the world and stuff, but like it never translates to this rage or this, right. you know, like, and I never had like, oh, I don't know what my place is, you know, like that's, I've, I've benefited from a relatively stable life <laughs> yeah. and uh, never really had well, these things come across. So that's, yeah, it's not like I don't need, I guess I don't need that outlet, you know. Well, um, there's a metric yeah. shit ton of trauma with these people too. Like yeah. Henry Rollins has shared yeah. that he was abused as a child. Child. He was yeah. severely beaten up at one point. Other members of the band is what you know. What I mean, it's just right. there's a there's a level of you know like connective tissue that I mean I don't know if you have to have it, but it certainly helps to unpack it. And then you throw in that also it's designed as music for a scene. So when you're not in the scene, you don't have the life experiences, yep. and you don't have the visceral connection. I mean, yeah. It's it's not even a negative thing. Strike to say one, that, two, and yeah. three. You know. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, yeah it's going to be impenetrable for you. Right. I would I would say that too that this album feels much more interior if we're comparing to Dead Kennedys, whereas I feel like Dead Kennedys is looking at the world and saying how fucked up it is. But yes. this feels like you're looking at yourself or the whoever's writing the songs are looking at themselves and saying. This is how fucked up we feel inside. This is how other people feel fucked up inside. You well, go, the dead, you don't get the, the feeling the dead Kennedys are afraid of becoming what they're yeah. singing about, even though they kind of did, right? If you ask Jello Biafra. But Black Flag, I think part of the fear of this is like, I'm afraid I'm going to end up like these, the, the protagonist of Six Pack and yeah. thirsty and miserable and. You know, or I might have violence befall me because, like, life has been violent for me, you know? Right. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, I would say that Dead, I like Dead Kennedys better than this, too. Uh, and and uh, they also had more, they had different musical parts kind of thrown in there that made yeah, it more yeah. interesting for me as more of a music listener. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they had some kind of cool parts that they were able to deviate a little bit from, like, the full-blown hardcore sound. Yeah. So that, that, you know, I still wasn't a huge fan of that record, but I, it had it gave me some moments here. It's, it's harder, yeah. Well, they considered themselves to be... You know, the the Dead Kennedys, a lot of what they were pulling from was like 50s and 60s rock and roll. Whereas, yeah. I mean, Black Flag, if you ask them who their influences are, they talk about sort of like the experimental jazz folks, Frank Zappa, you know, elements of metal, you know, a lot of stuff that is n notorious, you know, for deviating from the pop sound yeah. standbook. Mm. Yeah, that's by choice. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine just on a... <laughs> Like being able to sing like that night in and night yeah. out. I don't. I don't mm -hmm. know how you would train your voice to do that. So I I respect that. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, as you saw, uh, you know, yeah. they they <laughs> lost the singer who literally couldn't keep it up because right. Dana yeah. couldn't do it. Yep. And Ray, as the singer before them, I guess before that could, but I think just the violence. It was kind of like, what is this scene? And I think even it was too much for him, right? But it's, yeah, I. It seems somewhat will, naive to think there wouldn't be violence associated with this when you're going into it. but Well, and the scene later sort of pushed back on the violence a little bit. And it wasn't like in Great Britain when you read about the punk scene and there was always sort of like a real push to not have the racism or the hooliganism kind of come in. It was sort of something they always were guarding against. And, you know, you'd later – part of what Straight Edge was was – get these meatheads and these fucking drunks out of here. And that's kind of what it came from. You know what I mean? It came mm. from these people would drink and, you know, fight. And, like, we want the energy, but we don't want that fucking baggage. Whereas yeah. I think with Black Flag, it was like, you know, to truly to truly have this, you got to come as you are, right? That the everyman nature of it, which is what they are. You know, it's kind of like you come at it from where your vantage point is and you experience at it. And I can see how that would be scary for people too, because it's like, boy, you got to take everything they are. Yep, you got to take everything they are. So, mm. yeah, John, you'll like this too. They have two other albums. Uh, one's called "Slip It In," and the other mm -hmm. one's called "Loose Nut." So, uh, from '84 well, and '85, they're funny. They albums sound also. slightly <laughs> different too, because that's when they were trying to go in a different musical direction yeah. by that point. Mm. So, um, yeah. yeah, they and this there's is a couple. They're they're a little bit more musical, Matt, in terms of yeah. ways you'd understand. So I I don't think there's ever a Black Flag album for you. Let me start yeah. by saying that. But those would be ones that there's big there's more pieces for yeah. you. In. Let's put it that way. Well, we're not covering them again. I don't think, are we? Nope. Yeah. No. Yeah. So this third one right on. So the rare abstention from a rating for me. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. But I you know, I can't say I. I I can't say I dislike this though because I 
I, I get it to he, some degree. He did that for another... What was the other album you abstained from? It wasn't too long ago. There was another one I remember you doing that for. I have to look that up. I, the that only stack. other one I can remember I didn't abstain, I think um, uh, uh, the pop group, I think I said, like, I need more time yeah. with this album. Hmm. It's hard for that. me to truly rate this yeah. because I feel like there's... I need more time to kind of unpack it. And we mm. just didn't have enough in a cold listen hot take format. So I think that might be what you're thinking I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right.